we're bringing in talent 1,000%. So have a lot of cap space. Love it. And cash. Yeah. Ready to burn some cash. Look, I'm, I'm a first-year head coach. I didn't mean, like, burn some cash. I know we have a lot of uh, cash to utilize, but we are going to utilize it the right way. I've told them, look, I don't want to do splashy things just to get attention and get good headlines one day. In terms of just physical physical skills, uh, we need to weaponize the offense. I would say offensively this year, uh, we were very picky as far as the players that we were getting. That wasn't really a deep offensive free agent class. I hope the next expectations is to make the playoffs. I would just ask uh, Patriot fans for patience. I really feel we have a good young team, and I just hope we don't struggle. They don't want to be involved in football decisions. One way or another, I'd like us to see us get a top-rate young quarterback. We sit at a very uh, enviable spot at number three where we could take someone at three or, you know, if someone offers a bag, as we would say, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of first-round picks, uh, we definitely have to you know, talk about those things. All right, deep dive and uh, Patriots kind of being all over the place. Mike, you were down there to witness those uh, interviews firsthand. How are you feeling right now after after those couple of days about this new regime? It just felt very scattered. It's felt very scattered pretty much since they named Gerard Mayo the coach, the press conferences. You hear Robert Kraft talk. You know, he starts off the answer, like, what are the expectations? Oh, you know, I put my fan cap on. Playoffs. And then, well, we could be lousy, but then, no, I'm hopeful that things are going to be good. And I like what we're doing so far. Like, you're contradicting yourself in your same answer. And I just feel like there's been a lot of that over the course of this offseason. And when I look at Gerard Mayo and some of the things that he's had to sort of step, take a step back on and say, but that's not really what I meant, I'm okay with that because it's his first time doing this. And I think there's going to be some growing uh, pains with that where he's not going to say everything that he needs to say or present it in the right way at the beginning here because he's going through the process. But in general, I feel like the owners should know better. I, I, it just – I don't love it. I just – I haven't, I haven't <laughs> loved what I've seen so far. The, the way I put it earlier this week was, you know, Bill Belichick. We're used to Bill Belichick saying nothing by actually saying nothing, by, by grunting into a microphone, whereas now we're getting so much from multiple different parties that it feels as though, like, there's nothing to take away. So you're still, in a way, getting nothing – it's just in a much different fashion. Yeah, I put it as they're overcorrecting. They want so badly to not be like Bill Belichick that they can't figure out who they want to be. Are you worried, Phil, that Robert Kraft, Jonathan Kraft, who's ever in charge over there, is going to have a, maybe a little too much say in what they do personnel-wise? Uh, I don't. What I worry about is Elliot Wolf having say, which we know he does. That's our understanding of it. He's going to have the final say. If there is any kind of disagreement, we know they want collaboration. But if there is any sort of butting of heads at all, he's got the final say on the decisions that can be made here. The, the worry I have is not that he's qualified or he, that he'll do a good job, but it's, it's the status of his employment moving forward. It is just – it's odd to us. I know there have been situations in the past where there are personnel changes after the draft. I get that. But for so many key decisions to be made this offseason, specifically with the number three overall pick, and for the person to be making that decision not to have a title beyond the draft, Mike, is very strange to me. And not only do we not know what his title is beyond the draft, they're going to be doing interviews. Like, we know that. They're having interviews for front office people post-draft. It's a very strange situation for me. Yeah, my feeling on this, Phil, and, I, and I, I've heard the same things that you have, that you guys have reported, obviously, that they are going to talk to general managers. They have to go through that process. But, like, Alonzo Highsmith coming up here, he and Elliot Wolf sort of been best buddies for years, worked in a bunch of different organizations together. I don't think Highsmith's leaving the University of Miami unless he's pretty confident that Elliot Wolf is going to be the guy in charge here. I would be very surprised if that's not the case. Now, again, there's certain things, the Rooney rule, they have to go through. They have to, they have to deal with that process. But I feel like unless he falls on his face, Phil, that, that he is eventually going to be the guy. But do you think, you know, going back to the crafts for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with it. I, and look, the number three pick, ownership is going to be involved. It's the number three pick in the entire draft. And if you say, no, we want to trade back for 11, 23 and a, and a future first or a second or whatever the, the combination platter is, he might just say, guys, man, we got no quarterback. J Jacoby's a bridge for one year. Like, don't we feel good enough about one of these guys to pick him? I mean, we hired you as a coaching staff. Shouldn't you be able to coach him up? So I am a little bit concerned, though, that, that maybe, like, if they don't feel strongly about it and Robert's like, no, you need to take that quarterback, that would 
I mean, I think the, the Mac Jones thing, I think that was part of the Mac Jones thing, right? We need a quarterback. Well, there's one. We're going to take him. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Mike in that. Elliot, in my opinion, will be the guy moving forward. But the reason I bring it up is because if the owner is saying, as he said at owner's meetings the other day, that he would really like a top-rate young quarterback, yes. even if we think the guy who's in that front office seat right now is going to be the guy moving forward, is there not some pressure on him, Trenny, to make the owner happy to – lock in that job for the foreseeable future? I think there is. So I think there is a little bit too much. It's just an odd situation in that if Elliot Wolf thinks the best decision for the team is to trade down because he doesn't love one of these quarterbacks, if Robert Kraft is still in his ear and those comments are still in his ear about drafting a quarterback, that to me is not a situation well, you want. And at least it seems like, based on the numbers we saw, a number of guys, nine guys at Jaden Daniels Pro Day, nine guys at Drake May. Like, I'm it's okay not just that. the owner. You are okay with yeah. that? It's not too many, too many cooks in the kitchen? No, because I don't think – listen, if there are nine people involved on the decision as to whether – they're trading back or staying and taking a quarterback, that's way too many. Yeah. That's a three-person, maybe four. Gerard Mayo, Elliott Wolf, Robert Kraft, and maybe Jonathan Kraft, right? That, that's a four-person decision. I don't care about what T.C. McCartney, <laughs> all due respect to T.C. McCartney, has to say about trading back or staying there and making the pick. If it's about Jaden Daniels versus Drake May or Drake May versus J.J. McCarthy or Michael Penix in the second round, then – all the opinions are good opinions to me. I want more information. I want some disagreement because I think that's how you get to the bottom of who these players really are. I think that might help your evaluation and really lock it in in the right way. Elliot Wolf's dad, Ron Wolf, talked about this all the time. Like to get into a room, sit in that room. We bring up the guy on the tape, and everybody starts talking about, well, what do you like? What don't you like? And then at the end, yeah, I got to make the decision, but I want to hear all the opinions because maybe, just maybe, someone brings something up and they say, I should go back and watch that yeah. to either confirm it or deny it. All right. Well, one person we haven't heard much from is Jonathan Kraft. And Jerry's colleague at Boston Sports Journal, Greg Bedard, thinks that needs to change. It's time for Jonathan Kraft to start answering questions about this franchise. Look, Jonathan Kraft and Robin Glazer are running this team the, the behind the scenes. That's what they are doing. They are more involved um, than a lot of people know. And for them to put Robert Kraft basically out there as sort of a shield from the tough questions, I'm sorry, it doesn't cut it anymore. Not with what's gone on with this franchise. And you can't just wave a, it was all Bill's fault type of thing. And then we're just like, okay, well, now we're going to wait and see. Robert can certainly do his role, but in terms of day-to-day -day accountability of this franchise and where it is, it's time for Jonathan Kraft to stand up and answer the questions. Is Bedard right, Phil? Is Jonathan Kraft using his dad as a shield? I and mean, we saw it when Gerard Mayo was getting announced. You know, there was a, you know, an emergency, a paper emergency somewhere that, you know, he couldn't be at the press conference. But I, I think we all know it's, it, it's only a matter of time before Jonathan, if not already, is really in charge of this team, not the 83, 84-year-old Robert Kraft. I would love to hear more from Jonathan Kraft. I think, and I would love to hear more from Greg Bedard uh, based on that commentary right there, because I think that's a little strong. When he says Robin Glazer and Jonathan Kraft are running the team, I think a lot of people out there say, so are they making the pick at number three overall? And that, to me, is not the case. I don't believe that to be true. So I'd love to hear more detail from Greg on that. I can't go into more detail on that based on what he knows because that's not driving with what I know. Um, I, of course, would love to hear more from Jonathan Kraft, but, Mike, I think he's probably really reluctant until his dad wants to step away mm -hmm. to be out in front of the cameras because he wants that to be Robert's role until Robert doesn't want that role anymore. And Jonathan was at the meetings, but the hat's pulled down. Like, and he sort of just kind of drifts in, in and out of things. Like, he wants to be sort of behind the scenes at this point. And to Phil's, you know, point there as well, I think it's like, look, my dad likes this. This is part of who he is, and he likes being out in front of things. And Jonathan right now is perfectly content to be behind the scenes, but I think there are some answers that he could give us that maybe his dad is not going to or not willing to. And we're, we're getting to that point where we, we do need to hear from more from him.